Um, hello, welcome to the SIGAuth deep dive. Uh, my name is Tim Alclair. I'm a SIGAuth subproject owner and emeritus chair. I'm Rita Jane, I'm also a SIGAuth uh, co chair. I'm Okan, I'm also one of the co chairs. Welcome. Um, so for our topics today, uh, we are just going to go through um, a bunch of the work that SIGAuth is, has in the pipeline, um, a few things that are basically finished. Um, so we've got a couple things uh, that recently graduated to Stable that we're going to talk about, um, uh, a bunch of things that are kind of uh, in the progress of being implemented, um, and then a few uh, provisional, um, sorry, a few caps that we're um, still working through the design of. So, um, show of hands, who here is familiar with pod security admission? All right, pretty good. Um, yeah, so pod security admission uh, graduated to stable in 125, which is the same release that pod security policy was removed from tray in. Um, so pod security admission we designed to be like super simple security out of the box for Kubernetes enabled by default. Um, it's not exactly, well, it's not at all a feature complete replacement for pod security policy. Um, and so this was kind of covering the like, you know, 80 or 90% use case. And then for everything else, uh, we're referring people to um, uh, the whole ecosystem of policy engines um, and other options around that. Um, yeah, uh, oh wait. You wanna talk about the tool, the, the migration tool? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I did a talk on the uh, topic of migrating from pod security policy to pod security admission um, yesterday. So if you didn't manage to catch that um, and you're interested in that, I recommend watching the replay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we uh, also have some guides published on how to do that migration. Um, and we have a, there's a Kubernetes SIGS project uh, called POTS PSP Migrator, um, which automates a bunch of the tasks in the, the migration workflow, like um, uh, fig identifying mutating PSPs, which when you disable that can potentially cause problems with things that uh, no longer work. So if you're familiar with certificates and the CSR API within Kubernetes, uh, traditionally speaking, when you ask for a certificate, uh, you were completely on the whim of the signer to decide the length of that certificate, uh, which for all intents and purposes meant somewhere between one and five years is a cert that came out with no revocation attached. So amazing security. Uh, but uh, we fixed that not too long ago, so now if you want, you can request the duration of your certificate to be shortened as low as 10 minutes. And all the built-in signers to the controller manager honor this, the GKE signer honors this, cert manager signers honors this, and I think I found all the ones that were open source and I fixed them. So uh, it's optional, but well supported, I think, now. All right. Um... So now we're gonna talk about the implementable caps uh, that, are, that, that the, the SIG is currently working on. Um, how many of y'all are using uh, KMS encryption or encryption at rest at all? I just wanna show a hand. Cool, thank you, great. Mm. <laughs> thank you for doing that for your companies. Um, uh, so yeah, so for both, v, uh, for both V1 and V2, um, there's been some changes uh, that, that's coming along. Uh, for example, default crypto alg uh, algorithm for KMS data encryption is now default to GCM. Um, so uh, for those who uh, didn't want to use CBC, now that is uh, available by default. Uh, in 124, you can still uh, use CBC, uh, and both CBC and GCM are in read-only format. Uh, and starting in 125, um, write will start using GCM by default, um, but read can still support GCM and uh, CM, CBC for backward compatibility. Uh, and then starting from KMS v2, um, the default will only be GCM. Uh, and uh, for those who uh, may be following the SIGAuth uh, PRs, uh, we just merged a CRD encryption 
uh, yesterday, so really excited about this. What this means for you is uh, in starting in 126, you can now encrypt your custom resources uh, and just add your uh, custom resource in the list of resources in, in your encryption configuration. Uh, and your pandas are happy. <laughs> Um, and uh, also, um, you know, as we kind of look at encryption at rest, we're also wondering, um, do the does the community actually want to encrypt all the resources, right? So we currently have an issue open out there. If you think this is important to you, um, you know, a wildcard that actually encrypts everything, as we think should be the default behavior for Kubernetes, uh, you know, secure by default, um, please plus one or let us know your, uh, if there's an, an interest there. And if so, we would like to also push for that and perhaps make that a default behavior going forward. Uh, so please uh, look for that issue. Uh, and we also have hot reload uh, for encryption uh, configuration, especially for folks who have done this in the past. Y'all know how hard it is to make updates there, which will also require a API server restart, uh, which is very problematic uh, and could put your cluster at risk. Uh, and so with hot reload, changes will actually be watched. Um, and then starting in 126, we'll have this. Um, and then the deck cache for now is only uh, reset on reload. Uh, again, for those of you who've used KMS encryption v1, I'm sure you've known this gaps for a while. Uh, and this is, I think we introduced KMS v1, what, 110 or something like that. So this is years ago, right? And it's still in v1 beta 1. Um, and we would like to change that, right? So some of the gaps that we have uh, learned along the way uh, are, you know, uh, performance, right? This is why we couldn't uh, push this to stable, right? Uh, with currently with V1, performance is pretty bad if you have large number of uh, secret objects that you want to encrypt, uh, which can actually slow down your cluster startup time, right? And, and the reason for that is all the requests actually are making uh, remote requests against the remote KMS, uh, and your request can also be relimited, right? Uh, again, this is not great if you're trying to create a cluster, right? Uh, and then key rotation is another problem, right? Again, if you're an operator, you've been managing your uh, Kubernetes cluster, you, you know how problematic this is. Today, it's a very manual process, very error prone. Um, and hard to determine which key is actually in use, right? So again, we would like to change that. Uh, and we also thought about what kind of health check and status that operators would love to have. Uh, today, whenever uh, we want to check the health of a KMS plugin, yeah, the, the API server will have to make a, a, an actual encrypt or decrypt request, which is not ideal, and the health data is actually not very useful. Um, and last but not least, we want observability, right? Uh, and today, because there's no tracing ID, uh, it's very hard to correlate events in the logs. So you, you actually don't know which request went from the API server to the plugin and then to the actual uh, remote KMS. So we would like to also change that. Uh, and here we're introducing uh, KMS v2 alpha 1. Uh, again, this, is, uh, this went into alpha. Uh, in V125, um, so if you want to check it out, uh, these, the, the cap is there as well as some usage guidance in the Kubernetes docs website. Uh, so to use this feature, you would enable the API server feature gate uh, to, to use KMS V2. Uh, and again, this comes with GCM by default. Uh, and it's, go it's alpha in 125 and 126, and we're hoping to target beta in 127. Again, if you want to get involved, please join the, um, the, K the SIGAuth KMS dev uh, channel on Kubernetes Slack. Uh, again, some of the benefits, you know, we talked about the gaps. Now, what do you get with the V2? Uh, again, so for performance, we actually have uh, a, a reference implementation to help all the KMS plugins out there to see how you can leverage uh, the recommended approach, which uh, has a key hierarchy design such that um, you will have a local uh, key encryption key so that you reduce the number of remote requests that you have to make to the remote KMS. 
and, and, and again, we are targeting 126 to have this uh, reference implementation. Uh, and for key rotation, uh, we now have added beta, uh, metadata to track the actual KMS key that is being, being used for each request. Uh, and again, this allows us to actually have automated rotation without ha having to restart the, K the API server. Uh, and we've introduced a new status API. Uh, so again, the API server can just call this status API to check the health of the plugins uh, separated out from actual encryption and decryption requests. Uh, last but not least, we also added a new UID, uh, which is generated for each uh, envelope operation. And again, uh, this helps us identify which requests actually went through the, the entire uh, uh, workflow. Uh, and we also have a new proto uh, format for the data that is stored in SCD. And, and again, this is to give operators the ability to use a, a, you know, a proto buff viewer to actually see the data that is stored in SCD. All right, this is gonna be really hard to, um, so just bear with me. Um, I kind of want to walk you through a, a, a day in the life of an encryption and decryption request. What does that actually look like? Um, so as you can see, imagine you have an encryption request coming from the API server. What we're introducing is this hierarchy, key hierarchy concept, right? So today with existing uh, uh, KMS plugins, the request comes in, uh, the plugin sends it to the KMS, the remote KMS, encrypts the, da the, the, the data encryption key and returns the encrypted key back to the API server. That's how it works today. With this new key hierarchy uh, design, what this means is you, the plugin uh, developer, can actually add a local keck, uh, cache that basically says, hey, for all the, request, all the encryption and decryption, I'm going to use this local keck, which is going to be encrypted by the remote uh, key, right? That's stored in the remote KMS. Uh, and then that is actually the key that is going to be encrypted. And that will also be the key that is cached uh, in the plugin. And that data is get, gets returned to the encryption uh, response. And then the API server says, hey, looks like here's my encrypted uh, data encryption key, and here's the key that I'm using for uh, the, the remote key that I'm using, and here's the local key encryption key uh, that is cached by the plugin. And similarly, uh, for decryption, you now imagine you have this key hierarchy design, right? Uh, the API server says, hey, looks like this this request actually is using a local keck. So I'm gonna ask the cache, the, 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 the key cache, to look for the local key encryption key. And if that's found, I'm going to use that instead of making a remote request, right? And that will also be the key that is used for decryption. Uh, and, then, uh, re and then that's the key that is uh, stored in KMS, uh, in SCD as well. Uh, what this means is you're reducing thousands and thousands of requests to the remote KMS down to, you know, n number of uh, requests, just, just depending on how you set up the, the configuration. Um, so if you have three API servers, potentially you only make three requests to your remote KMS, which is beautiful. You, you save money and you reduce the, the performance impact. Uh, so what does that proto uh, buff format look like? As I mentioned earlier, here as you can see, the data that is actually stored on SCD, it, there's a prefix, looks very similar to V1. Uh, it will say KMS V2. Uh, and then the actual object is actually stored in this beautiful structured proto buff format. And as you can see, there's the encrypted data and then there's the encrypted uh, data encryption key, which are encrypted. However, the key ID and the annotations are not, in, uh, not stored in an encrypted format uh, so that as an operator, you can actually go and in, in look at this data and understand which key was actually used for encryption and decryption. And then there's also a little room where if you want to add things, you could add to the annotation. Um, a very, very tiny uh, space there. All right. Thank you, Rita. Uh, so 
I guess as a member of SIGAUTH, at some point I got exhausted by not knowing who I was on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so we added an API so you can do that. Uh, so it's alpha and 126. And I expect basically no changes to this API because there's basically no inputs and I don't really know what else it would do. So hope, hope to see that one soon. Uh, so anyone here familiar with client go credential plugins? Anyone seeing all the fun warnings coming out of like the GKE CLI saying it's going to get deleted soon? <laughs> uh, same is true for ACAST, don't worry. Um, but uh, if you're familiar with the interface that that mechanism has, it requires that the credential that is used for authentication be directly passed to ClientGo or kubectl as an example. That means it cannot be based off of like a hardware-based uh, uh, credential because hardware doesn't give you the credential. So this is an extension to that existing API that will allow us to support something like uh, MTLS with you know, keys that are stored in the KMS, uh, as well as a, if you want to run like a front proxy in front of your API server and you want to have uh, signed requests, it'll be able to do that. Or maybe you just want to add some custom headers for logging or audit purposes, all, all those things will be possible. So instead of just purely being able to pass a credential, you'll be able to basically fully control the request before it's sent to the API server. Um, continuing on with the theme for certificates, uh, we want to make it easier for consumption of like certificates and, and signers within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, as a first small step in that direction, uh, we are working on adding a dedicated API called the Cluster Trust Bundle to allow you to specify CA bundles that can be reused in various contexts within the Kubernetes API. So the initial implementation will just be available as something the kubelet can mount into your pods for you. Uh, going on in the future, there's still some uncertainty exactly all the places will do this. Uh, one sort of obvious place is the Kubernetes API server. Uh, so for example, if, you, if you've ever had to configure CA bundles for admission webhooks, uh, it'd be really great if you could configure that in one place and update it in one place and not have to remember every other place that you had to update that. Uh, one of the open questions there that's still undecided is the API server, unlike most clients, is uh, you know high memory, high CPU, uh, we can kind of hold it to a higher bar, and traditionally we haven't uh, had revocation support and certificates in Kubernetes, uh, but this is one place we're exploring being able to add uh, like CRL support, so that way if you wanted to revoke a cert, at least the API server would honor it for you. Uh, and I suspect that's a client that many people care about. Um, yeah, so legacy service count tokens are uh, the secret-based service count tokens um, that Kubernetes originally had. Um, in, uh, I can't remember, when did we introduce bound service count tokens? I think 123, something like that. I think it was GA, I think, in 122. Okay, so in the last two years. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been a long time. We had bound service count tokens, which are generated on the fly for a pod running with those service counts, um, with that service count, or anything that wants to create a token review request. Um, those also expire. Uh, they're bound to, they have a expiration time and need to be refreshed, and they're also bound to the pod lifecycle. Um, but we still, in Kubernetes, have these uh, legacy service account tokens that are still generated for uh, each, um, well, they were still generated for each uh, service account. Um, and so you still have these secrets that if someone managed to, if, if those got leaked, they would still be used, um, could still be used, they weren't, uh, they never expired. Um, and so we're excited to be able to, to get rid of those um, for cases that don't need it. Uh, so as of 124, uh, we're no longer um, auto-generating those. Um, and then in 126, we're adding an alpha to make it easier to migrate clusters off of legacy service count tokens. Um, and so there's, a, if this feature is enabled, there's a couple tracking uh, 
features that get added. Um, so the um, so if you do use the legacy service account tokens, it gets a warning. There's actually like labels that get added to the uh, secret itself um, to represent the that to show that those have been used. Um, and uh, yeah, make it easier to identify the use and, and migrate off of those. Wait, did you? Uh, so as an explanation of what provisional means here, uh, the things we're about to talk about are completely uh, up in the air at this exact moment. There isn't necessarily agreement among the SIG or the community that this is where we're going. But there are kept open for this, and also if you want to get involved, this is a great place because we haven't written any code yet. Um, so if folks are familiar with the existing OIDC integration that the Kubernetes API server supports, um, it's very limited. Uh, you can only have one, and sort of the control you get over the identity that's asserted in the Kubernetes API is pretty limited. Um, and it's really hard-coded to support ID tokens from the OIDC spec even though the OIDC folks disagree with our use of that. Um, so uh, some of the things that this new API fixes is uh, you can have as many providers as you want. Um, and uh, following along the, less, uh, the rest of the Kubernetes community, we are uh, hoping to use Cell to give you much more flexibility around how you actually assert the identity to the Kubernetes API server, as well as how you validate constraints on those identities. Um, so you can kind of see some examples on the bottom for how you would validate that I an identity is something that is allowed to be on this cluster, as well as how you would actually do the final extraction of claims. Um, uh, our hope is, uh, like one of the things that I, don't, we, I know we don't have agreement on right now is can this be used outside of Kubernetes ID, uh, or outside of OIDC ID tokens. Uh, so I see spiffy shirts, I see Spire shirts. I, uh, I see spiffy people. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm looking. Uh, so I mean, perhaps we could use this for uh, spiffy dots, you know, that'd be cool. Uh, I haven't convinced Jordan yet. <laughs> I know, but uh, yeah. Uh, Another thing I want to be able to do is today, uh, tokens have just a hard-coded 10-second cache just to like completely uh, cause, uh, not, to prevent like a DOS against the API server. But otherwise, like if you have a webhook, it's a pure hard-coded cache of like some number of minutes, whatever you configure. Uh, in the case of Jots, you know, we, we can have a claim that tells us the expiration time. So, you know, you can imagine a much more intelligent cache that caches it to that duration or until like a key rotation occurs, you know, whichever one happens first. So just all around better semantics. Sort of following in that same trend, today you can only have one authorization webhook configured on the API server. Uh, so we wanna be able to support uh, as many as people would want in whatever order they wanna run them in. Uh, if folks don't know, today, if your authorization webhook is down, uh, we fail open. Uh, so if it was a webhook that could have denied a request, uh, we won't know. We'll just, we'll just keep going, um, which is not exactly what people expect. Uh, another thing that we want to make it really easy to do is, unlike admission that only runs on like create, update, and a few other places, authorization always runs on every request. So if you want to be able to have many webhooks but not have any single one of them being down ca completely catastrophic to your environment, we want to let you scope whence a webhook would be invoked. So if you know a webhook only interacts with like users from a particular IDP that all have a prefix, you know, we, want, we want to be able to support that kind of use case. Or if you want to run the webhook on the API server, well, you're going to have a bit of a circle in your dependency graph unless you can filter out certain identities from being uh, targeted by that webhook. So we're considering cell-based filters there. Uh, similar to KMS and various other features, uh, and this is true for the OIDC thing earlier as well, we, we don't want any API server restarts unless like absolutely necessary. So even though these things are CLI flags, uh, we want to reload the config so that way if you can change the file on disk, you don't worry about anything else. Uh, right. 
So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, last but not least, what, right, we also want to talk about some of the cross six work that's been going on. Um, and I think all three actually are part of SIG mach uh, API machinery. Uh, and, you know, as Mo mentioned earlier, multiple times. Uh, cell, this is the cell for emission control uh, cap that's, uh, I think, recently merged uh, in one, for 126. And this is going to touch on, you know, policies for emission, validation, mutation, as well as authorization. So there's a lot of overlap between the, the two SIGs. Um, and then also we have storage version API cap and the API server identity cap. Um, both are very crucial to ensure we have HA on the API server, which is the foundation to ensure we can actually rotate the, the KMS keys. So it's actually our part of the KMS v2 uh, future as well. Anything you want to add? Um, and of course, we couldn't do this without all of the new contributors that made this possible. I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to all the uh, folks who really, really helped us drive a lot of these changes. Uh, Anish, Christoph, Damien, Nilek, Andrew, Tahari, if you're listening, thank you for all your contributions. Thank you. And thank you for joining this talk, and please use this QR code and give us your feedback. Thank you. Any questions? I can walk around with a mic. I think this is time for mask. You described some changes to the client Go plugins to the interface, and you mentioned that you'll have more control over, say, adding headers and such. Um, is the, and you said there was some concern about passing the data back through the, the client Go library, so it's a little confusing. How does the request make it out containing the contributions from the plugin? So we, we went through a few designs on this. Uh, like we, I think the initial version of this cap was open like almost a year and a half ago now. Uh, but what we settled on was it would be really hard to make an API that served everyone's use case. And also we were tired of extending this part, so we wanted to be done. Uh, so effectively what we do, or what we're planning to do is basically the plugin can give us a proxy and we will just connect to that proxy and we would expect you to basically fully terminate the request and then you can do whatever you want with it. So please actually send it to the API server, but if you don't, that's also fine, I guess. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you get to do whatever you want because um, you make the request, not us. Uh, so it's, it's, it's meant to be an incredibly powerful extension point. Uh, hopefully that m most time people don't need, but. Uh, 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 Nick from AWS, and uh, they, they wanted to make it so their kubelets could do request signing back to AWS Infra, for example. It's a great use case, totally not supported by the existing uh, extension point, but we're hoping that, you know, others can use it too. So. Are you guys excited about the new features that are coming? <laughs> Oh, Bridget. Oh, one quick question. Thank you. Great talk. And I'm so excited about all of those new features that are coming. Can you, I would love to hear from any or all of you, which ones you think would be a great choice for new contributors to jump in on? <laughs> we were just talking about that, actually. Say what? <laughs> we were talking about how hard it is to start <laughs> in SIGOTH. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I think the, the stuff that's provisional is certainly easier because we haven't f written much or any code for a lot of it. Um, the bar is a little bit higher than maybe we want it to be, but it, it is kind of hard. Um, if, uh, for the KMS v2 stuff, we do have a dedicated um, GitHub board where there's quite a few right. issues that are not you know, even started. So if, I don't know if you're familiar with encryption at rest and 
want to suffer through API server wiring, um, then yeah, that's 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 for you. Also, the to get involved, it, you know, coding is one part, but the other part is also give us your feedback, right? And like as we write the designs, the cap, we will love for more feedback and reviews, right? And because um, y'all are the ones that's gonna use it. <laughs> um, like for example, you know, we have to work with all the KMS plugins, right, to to make sure the migration journey is not gonna be too terrible, right? We're, that's why we're writing the reference implementation. So um, please get involved, give us feedback, um, or just tell us, that, yeah, this makes sense to me. I'll, you know, I, I would prefer to use it this way, or, or maybe this doesn't make sense, and here's how I, I will like it. Um, definitely welcome those type of contributions. Um, if I could just add, I think uh, those are good answers for people who are experienced in this space, but you know, maybe not Kubernetes, but uh, understand a lot of the nuances of SIGAuth, have a lot to um, add on the design aspects. For um, like more kind of junior contributors or people who aren't as experienced in this space, I think actually the stable features are a really good place to jump in. Um, you know, I have a bunch of audit cleanups that I'm working on in the next release. It would be great to get some help on improving some of the testing around auditing and some of the other uh, graduated features have a lot of, um, there's always room for cleanup and testing improvements as well. That's a great point. Oh, yeah, that, that, so that reminds me on the OIDC um, a provisional cap, one of the prereqs for that cap is an open issue right now with, I don't know, like 20, 20 things on a list of like, this is the missing test coverage for OIDC. So like, and, and I, have, I have blocked new changes to all of that code effectively because I don't trust it did not break if you touch it. So, um, but. okay. Quick question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Great design on the key caching. I like the key wrapping part. Uh, I think that's really really cool thing and will solve a lot of latency issues. Uh, maybe just a general question. What is the scope of a seek? What are you guys focused on? What is in scope? What is out? Because I see authentication, authorization at the same time in there. Uh, so SIGAuth owns basically all authentication, authorization policy across Kubernetes. So like, as well as like, Service account. So basically, if there's a like a security aspect to some feature, either we're a participating SIG or we're the owning SIG. Um, also so policy. Yeah, po okay. policy as well. So like uh, like to contrast us with SIG security. SIG security exists to like help people that um, like for example, say you work in IT security or something, and you're a consumer of Kubernetes and you're building tools to run on Kubernetes. They do a lot of that work and outreach and help the community grow that way. We focus more on like the core code within Kubernetes, like pot security admission and all those things and how those mechanisms work. Uh, but certainly, you know, there's a lot of overlap between our SIGs and. You know. There's also a lot of overlap between SIG auth and API machinery. A lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but none oh, of our stuff works. There was a question over there, Tim. Oh, okay. Oh. Like yeah. yeah, first, thank you for the talk. It's very nice. Uh, I have a quick question about the upgrading. It looks like some features are like a break, a broken fe breaking feature without uh, backward compatibility. So is there any plan we put some automation uh, in, the, in the code when user do, so that when user do the upgrading, they don't break their cluster? They don't cause outage in the production environment. Was was there a specific feature that looked breaking? Uh, it's uh, sorry. It's like the. It looks like the algorithm you use GCM something. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. So yeah. So we were very careful on that. Uh, so yes, that if we had done it poorly, it would have indeed been a breaking change. Uh, but the way we wrote it. Uh, so we, we do require that you follow the Kubernetes uh, release guidelines of no skip releases. So you upgrade from one version to the next minor version or major version, whatever you want to call it in Kubernetes land. Um, but we always did it in a way so that if you did an upgrade, 
and used the cluster, realized something was wrong, and did an immediate downgrade, that neither would have any data corruption. So we, we staged it out over many releases, and we have retained, basically, till the end of time, the capability of reading the old formatted data. So like KMS v1 actually has like, I don't know, like two legacy formats that are still supported in our code base, even though we never wrote, we never write them out and we haven't written them out in like 10 releases. We just assume that there might be some old data that's never been rewritten. Uh, so we, we are very careful. I think the closest thing we have to a breaking change is not auto-generating secrets anymore for service accounts. Uh, but even then you, what? Yeah, past security policy, yeah. Well, yeah, well, we have I mean, migration but that, that one was, I mean, you can, it's unfortunate. you can run it as a web book if you really want. So, um, that's fair. We, we did remove a beta feature uh, without graduating, that's fair. Uh, I don't think we'll end up doing something similar for KMS v1 beta 1, uh, mostly because it's, I don't know, if you're happy with it, I guess doesn't really hurt us, I guess, if you keep using it. Whereas pot security policy did cause all sorts of confusion and just mistakes. Um, I, I just want to call out that, you know, you see, you see no user action required. <laughs> uh, that's very, very important. And this is exactly why uh, we want to make GCM as the default for write, but for to read, you can still do uh, both, right? Um, but the hope is that slowly everybody would just migrate to GCM. We're at time, but happy to stick around and take more questions in the hallway. Thank you for coming.